become a member. Sign in and start streaming today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the December 25th, 2020 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for joining us and Merry Christmas. As is our tradition, we are decked out in our favorite holiday sweaters, ready to give our year in review of 2020. So grab some eggnog and join us as we look back at the dumpster fire that was 2020. And, and actually, I, I shouldn't be so, so crass to say it was a dumpster fire because honestly, that's a little offensive to dumpster fires. Let's just get to the actual review of 2020. The biggest issue in Colorado this year was the, also the biggest issue around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic created a complete shutdown in Colorado in the spring, which began to open up back in the summer, but led to more restrictions in the fall. Governor Polis led the state's response to the virus, including mask mandates and various gathering restrictions. Protests to said mandates and restrictions also made headlines, as many restaurants and other businesses struggled to stay open with indoor dining bans and restrictions. Patty Calhoun from Westward, we start with you. When we look back at 2020, how did Colorado do, both as a, like our government officials and as a community, in response to COVID-19 in 2020? Well, we did not have terrorists decide they were going to kidnap the governor that we know of. So I guess we're doing better than Michigan. As we are coming out of a really horrible year, we have people who've spent the holidays alone again, who will spend the rest of the holidays alone again. It has been a really, really tough 2020. And the start of 2021, even with the vaccine coming, is not going to necessarily be any ray of sunshine. Santa did one big lump of coal in our stocking at the end of last year. I think Colorado in general has done better than most states, but we still have the politicization of masks, of all things. We have really, civil discourse has hit a new low. Whenever I look at comments on posts we post on westward.com, the level of vitriol is really horrifying, especially when you see what people are also doing to help their neighbors, what people are doing to help people they've never even met but they've heard about on next door. So in general, Colorado has acquitted itself pretty well. We seem to be leveling off right now at a high plateau that is not a pleasant place for anyone with still high case counts, way too many deaths. But Colorado in general has done better, I think, than the rest of the country. David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, David, not all of the restrictions and mandates that came from Governor Polis uh, held up legally, uh, but what are you, how do you grade the response from state government officials here in Colorado? I'd agree with Patty that it was overall adequate often and certainly less bad than, than in some other states um, and better than the federal response overall. So just look back to those innocent days of February and early March. Then we were being told that all the experts said we shouldn't wear masks. And uh, as Dr. Fauci later admitted, he knew better, but they were trying to minimize demand for masks because the U.S. had a mask shortage, because China had scooped up all the masks it could find globally. Even while the communist regime was claiming and the World Health Organization was repeating the lie that the uh, pandemic was the, the virus was no big problem. In the United States, we did once have plentiful reserves of masks because President George W. Bush built up a large stockpile. That Bush stockpile got used up during the uh, swine flu pandemic of 2009 and 2010, and afterwards it was never replenished. For a decade, President Trump and President Obama and Congresses of both parties failed to restock the reserves. A decade of bipartisan incompetence and recklessness. Eric Sonneman, columnist with uh, Colorado Politics and a longtime political analyst here on PBS 12. Uh, Eric, we had a government response in Colorado. We had a community response in Colorado and frankly pushed back to both. How do you look back at Colorado's response to COVID-19? Well, I'm tempted just to give my minute, particularly to Patty, because she said it so well, and uh, I let her go again. But given that I'm not going to do that, uh, you know, I, I guess I start, Dominic, with the old Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times. And if you say nothing else about 2020, Lord knows it has been an interesting time. Now, there are other adjectives on top of interesting, distressing uh, would be one that comes uh, very quickly to mind. Bizarre would be another. 
I think Colorado, as a general rule, has done better than many states. I think Jared Polis has been solid. He's been sound. He's been uh, calm throughout. He's been data-driven. Uh, he's there have been hiccups, uh, but uh, but by and large, uh, and and unlike uh, some of his Democratic peers among other governors, he has kept the state more open, at least than some of them. Uh, I think on the federal level, the lack of preparedness that David referenced, but it's worse than that. We had more than two months of advance notice that this was going to hit before it actually hit, uh, both as it went through China and as it went through Europe. And we completely and totally squandered those two months. The federal response has been the opposite of the Colorado response and it has reeked of incompetence. Penville Tate joins us, attorney with Tate Law and a former state lawmaker. Penn, as a former state lawmaker, you know how it feels to be a state official to respond in a crisis. I don't think you ever had to address a pandemic as a state lawmaker, but looking back at how state officials did, specifically Governor Polis and the entire government, how do you think Colorado responded in 2020 to COVID-19? You know, when you look at Colorado um, and compared to other states, I think it's fair to say that Governor Polis has been a star. Um, to Eric's point, he's done what he could to try to keep the economy and society moving in the wake of this pandemic, but he was also very aggressive with a combination of um, establishing the dial system that is run through the Colorado um, Public uh, Department of Public Health and, and Environment um, and working with counties and having them enforce mask mandates, social distancing, and, and making sure the message is echoed. Um, and repeat it and, and reinforce socially on a local level compared to the national response, which has just been a disaster. Um, we had a pandemic and it has simply aggravated everything uh, about the pandemic. And, and frankly, at the federal level, it has generated a second pandemic of intolerance um, and a lack of um, civility um, in our public discourse and, and community discourse, which is doubly frightening. Uh, and, and, and frankly, I think it has also illustrated that the third uh, major candidate in all elections this year, especially the national election, was the pandemic. I think voters uh, in many respects voted based on how the candidates responded to, dealt with, and talked about how they would address the pandemic moving forward. And I think um, that's uh, why you saw many of the real results that you did. In response to the death of George Floyd at the hands of police in Minnesota, Coloradans joined protests demanding justice. The protests throughout the summer featured both peaceful marches against racism and riots and vandalism by different individuals. The state capitol and other downtown buildings were vandalized and boarded up for weeks after clashes between rioters and police. David, uh, how downtown looked uh, with boarded up windows and vandalism, it looked that way for a long time this summer. Uh, is how we handled it this year, do you think, going to spur changes? Hopefully, but probably not. Uh, the, the Colorado American Civil Liberties Union, the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, and the Independence Institute have been working together on police improvement laws and, and projects ever since the, the 1990s. And for example, in February, I testified in the state legislature in favor of the American Civil Liberties Union bill uh, for police reform. And that bill was later enacted in the summer after uh, the sponsors made some good changes after co consultation with responsible law enforcement leaders. But the people who cooked up defund the police aren't allies in making law enforcement better. And they're not really against police violence. They frankly admit that they're Marxists. Every Marxist state is a police state, chock full of police violence. Marxists do want to get rid of the police who serve in a constitutional republic. And why not? They already have their own police. The rage mobs and the gangs who proved this year that when they want to rule the streets, they usually can. Eric, when we looked at the various reactions, we saw... Um the real issue spurring these protests, but then we saw other individuals taking advantage of these protests to have uh, riots and uh, causing a variety of vandalism throughout downtown Denver. Um, that also needs a reaction, but what did you think of how uh, policymakers handled both scenarios, both the reason some of the protests were happening, but also the results uh, in some of what was happening with uh, riots and vandalism? 
Yeah, I'd have to say it was a mixed bag. Uh, and I think it is important, as your question indicated, Dominic, to delineate between reasonable, responsible, completely consistent with American tradition and American freedoms, that kind of protest, versus protest that was really not protest, but went way across the line into looting and rioting, whatever. And it is important to make that distinction. And too many on both sides fail to make that distinction and put all of them in, into one uh, lump group. I'm left mainly, though, with the fact that this shouldn't have happened and didn't need to happen. The situation with George Floyd on a street in Minneapolis could have been diffused. The situation with Breonna Taylor shouldn't have happened. Lord knows the situation in Aurora, not far from where, uh, where you guys are in the studio today. Uh, with Elijah McClain should never have happened. These situations continue to happen time and time again. And it is time to put that into our past or at least to uh, put it deep into the recesses and have better policing uh, and to listen to the message of the responsible protests. Penn, your thoughts on both the protests in Colorado, uh, the, the riots and vandalism, and also some of the policy changes we saw happen at, in different government levels. You know, I think Eric hit it right on the head. Um, there is a reckoning that still needs to happen in this country. We may be closer to it, but it still needs to happen. Well, we have to deal with um, the role of slavery and racism in the founding of this country and reconciling it with our stated desire for uh, a representative, representative democratic form of government. We aren't there yet. And what these protests illustrated is that more and more people, and I was so heartened to see so many young people of all different races and colors coming together and protesting and marching peacefully saying, enough is enough. Now, no one condones the rioting and the looting that happened. And that was just a very, very small segment and a number of people. But you can't miss the more important message, which is that people around this country are fed up with the lack of diversity and inclusion, the lack of tolerance, and, and the systemic racism that exists in our society, and we are going to have to address it. There's a reason why Denver's own um, independent monitor came up with a 94-page report illustrating what was wrong with how local law enforcement responded to the situation. So we've got a long way to go. I think the legislature has done a lot to change state law and to begin to address this issue. But at the end of the day, we all know it's not gonna be laws that changes. It's gonna change, it's gonna have to be how we treat one another. Patty, never has seen protests before, uh, but was 2020 a watershed moment for the city? Well, we've seen protests like during the DNC. We've seen some bad protests before. Our office is right in the middle of all this. And for the most part, people did behave themselves well. People were very sincere in what they wanted to bring to the table, which is to say enough is enough. Definitely some people were absolutely out of control. They were out of control just because they wanted to cause trouble. And that's a tricky thing to deal with because you had a lot of people brand new to protests. They don't know crowd control. So we'll see how this evolves. But when you look at what happened with Elijah McClain in August of 2019, that two months later, police officers were mocking with selfies at his, um, by the site of his death, that then the DA, outgoing DA, decided there were no charges that could be filed. You can see where the outrage is, and we didn't have a lot of attention paid to that until finally it was hooked into the George Floyd protest. So we have a long way to go to make sure when bad things happen, we deal with them in the right way. Oh, yeah. There was also an election this year. Cory Gardner lost his U.S. Senate seat to John Hickenlooper, who earlier defeated Andrew Romanoff in a June primary. President Donald Trump lost to Vice President Joe Biden in Colorado and ultimately nationally. And voters were certainly in a yes mood when it came to ballot issues in Colorado, passing a paid family leave program and a state income tax reduction. Eric, you were my you were my wingman on Colorado Decides, so thank you again as always. I was surprised with basically the campaign that wasn't, which was the U.S. Senate race. We slept right through that one, but the ballot issues uh, came uh, and uh, provided a lot of surprises. Your takeaways from Election 2020? Well, I don't often take you on, Dominic, but I think your question was full of many errors and full of some fake news. We did indeed have an election in this country. 
Donald Trump won it overwhelmingly. Uh, there are some rumors out there that Joe Biden got 80 million votes. I think more accurately, it was 80 or maybe even as much as 800. But this notion of 80 million is just fantasy. Uh, and, um, you know, all of these people who are pur purveying fake news and agents of the deep state uh, and saying that our beloved president was not reelected and didn't even carry our home state of Colorado by overwhelming margins. What are they thinking? <laughs> a better analysis of 2020 I've yet to hear, Eric. Well done. Uh, Penn, as you look at the election, I, I was surprised with how many yes votes we saw for ballot issues, and it really didn't seem to be uh, uh, the, what it pertained to. We saw yeses to voting on enterprise fees and an income tax cut, and oh, by the way, also install a paid family leave program. Uh, were you surprised by the focus and the amount of attention that there was left for ballot issues in 2020? You know, I, I, I was somewhat surprised, but 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 I'd say somewhat because the national election took so much oxygen out of the room. That's where everybody focused. And in Colorado, once you got beyond the national election, there was a focus on the U.S. Senate race, which turned out to be less of a contest than people might have anticipated um, with regard to Corey's loss. And I think a number of people just didn't pay attention to some of the ballot issues. It wasn't until late in the cycle where you saw a lot of TV commercials dealing with some of those issues. And frank, frankly, policymakers, whether it's the General Assembly, the governor, or local governments have a mess to untangle in trying to reconcile some of these um, decisions that voters have made with regard to yes on so many different issues. It's it's. Uh, you know, for, for, the, for the policy nerds, it's going to be wonderful. For those who have to govern, it's going to be more than a notion. Uh, Patty, John Hickluber had a very interesting uh, 2020. He started out as a presidential candidate, uh, ended up as a uh, U.S. senator-elect, and in between had this family circus-like maze of, in, in Colorado politics that included uh, a, a, an ethics investigation and everything else you could think of. Uh, how do you think he's looking back at his 2020? Well, he'd actually gotten out of the presidential race before that in 2019. So he always knew he was running for Senate. Uh, I guess you might think, why do I really want to be in Washington, D.C. now? But he, uh, he didn't run an exciting campaign, but he got where he needed to get to. That ethics investigation was a political tool. You also had the fact that he didn't respond to it well. When, uh, when he was fighting, showing up, when he was talking about not remembering things, but they're fairly minor notes when you really look at what we've seen. So I think it's not a surprise that he got elected. Lauren Boebert, kind of the surprise and certainly someone to watch as we go on. Penn did nail the biggest surprise was in a year when you would think people are saying no. People said yes to so many of these measures in in Denver. We're taxing ourselves on climate change. We're taxing ourselves on homelessness. But the ones statewide, which are going to leave a really big mess, normally when people are confused, they say no. But people were just saying yes this year, and I still don't think we know why. David, in Colorado, the Republican Party saw, you know, they lost the U.S. Senate seat, but uh, Lauren Borbert was uh, an upset win in CD3, both in the primary and the general election. And a lot of policy issues really went their way between the enterprise fees and the income tax reduction. Uh, when they and others look back at the election of 2020, what do you think they remember most? Well, that there's a big difference between what voters think on the issues, which they showed by their, their ballot votes, as, as you said, uh, versus who they vote for when you have a quite unappealing uh, guy at the top of the ticket like, like Donald Trump. And his, his post-election flailing uh, shows that he is just as morally unfit for office as the Clintons. After losing in 2016, Hillary Clinton began claiming that the election had literally been stolen. And a lot of gullible people believed her. According to a 2018 YouGov poll, 66% of Democrats believe, quote, Russia tampered with the vote tallies in order to get Donald Trump elected president. And there's never been a shred of evidence for that claim believed by two-thirds of Democrats. And so, like Hillary, Donald is a lying loser, but unlike her, he's inept about it. She was smart enough not to file lawsuits and go into court. You can say anything you want in a speech or interview, but in court, you have to present evidence. And if your attorneys lie, they can get in big trouble with the court. So there's been a gigantic discrepancy between the claims Trump and his people have made in speeches versus the actual evidence, very thin, uh, submitted by his lawyers in court. 
While the year was dominated by COVID, protests and the election, other issues made major Colorado headlines. Colorado saw record-breaking wildfires that burned throughout the late summer and fall. Denver's homeless problem only got worse in a year where homeless encampments became a thing. And Denver's airport remodel hit some heavy turbulence. Uh, uh, Penn, we're going to start with you on this one. Take your pick. Plenty to choose from. Well, I'll take a swing at all three. Um, the debacle at DIA just shows what happens when you lie and deny and, and engage in subterfuge when you don't know what you're doing. Um, that's going to cost tens of millions of dollars to the traveling public, mostly those of us here in Colorado, um, and the mess isn't over yet. Yeah, the, the, the wildfires are disturbing because it's continuing a trend. If you don't want to believe in facts or science, and don't believe there's global warming, you at least have it to acknowledge the fact that it doesn't snow as much as it used to in Colorado 20 years ago. It doesn't rain as much as it used to, and something's going on, and we need to handle our natural resources, like our precious uh, national forest in the outdoors, um, differently. And finally, uh, the homeless situation, the unhoused, it just shows that the plight of the human condition in this state and other places is still very fragile. We've got a lot of work to do as a community at all levels of government to address that issue, or it's only going to get worse. Patty, in other years, any of these headlines could have made our topic one of the year, and they were relegated to our potpourri topic four. Your take? Well, let me play off a pen with homelessness. So we did vote in Denver to put a lot more money into this, but we still don't have a clear path on how to do it. And you really need to go off in a lot of different directions because the problem is different for so many different people. But we, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we as a city have to be prepared to really do what it takes to help those who need help and give them the right kind of help, but also reclaim the streets of the city. The Denver's been a great city, but who's been out there lately and seen what's really gone on? So in 2021, we have a lot of rebuilding, and I don't mean apartment building to do. Uh, David, wildfires, homeless encampments, uh, DIA, anything else? Your pick. Well, construction problems at Denver International Airport are, are nothing new. The airport was originally supposed to open in 1993 and didn't open until 1995. At its Stapleton Airport, it had been possible to walk from check-in all the way to your gate. But at DIA, most gates you can only get to by train, which is now very unsafe. Airplanes are safe because they refill the entire plane with fresh air several times an hour. That obviously can't be done on the, uh, the trains, and they also make personal distancing impossible. So maybe the Denver City government isn't quite as good at airport management as it thinks it is. Eric, you had a chance to wrap up the, the big issues of 2020. Well, I think you listed three big ones, Dominic. They're all tied together, probably under the word disaster. With respect to Denver International Airport, uh, Penn nailed that, uh, and uh, I would just echo that. Let me focus on the wildfires. I'm recording this from our, our place near Tabernash up in beautiful Grand County. But whether it's Grand County, which was hit and hit very hard, or, or many other parts of Western Colorado, it was just a hellacious summer and fall. Hats off to all of the firefighters, all of the first responders who battled these horrific blazes. Our home was spared. Our neighborhood was spared. But there are many people not that far away, 15, 20, and 30 miles away, who lost everything, uh, and hearts go out to them. It is time to name our disgrace of the year, and panel, you only have 30 seconds, so good luck with that. Patty. It is a year so full of disgraces, it's almost beyond belief. Of course, the overarching disgrace is COVID that has just taken lives away, literally and physically. But I have to say, of the responses to COVID, and we've seen a lot of bad ones, you have to give it to Mayor Hancock for the hypocrisy of his trip on Thanksgiving, the tweet half an hour before he got on a plane. Communication is key right now and in leadership, and we need to have some real leaders out there. Maybe a Mayor McNichol snowplow award. David. Mao Zedong. He's been dead since 1976, but the communist regime, which, by the way, spread that virus globally intentionally, is also carrying his program in other ways, committing genocide against the racial minorities in the Chinese empire, conquering Hong Kong, and the United States itself right now is going down a Maoist road. Under Mao's cultural revolution, and today in the United States, if you dissent from the extreme left, your job and your safety may be canceled. Eric, we go to you for your disgrace of the year. 
30 seconds, let's go. Number one, Donald Trump, an inept response to COVID, the crisis, and never investing really in that, uh, in, in managing that crisis. Number two, the aftermath of this election, the notion that people are challenging the rightful president-elect and that losing one after another in court, one recount after another, and they're still at it. Number three, the toxic level of political and civic discourse in this country, which has just taken us down a rabbit hole. Well done, Eric, right in 30 seconds. Penn, we go to you. I'm going to say ditto to everything Eric just said, and I just want to expand on it a little bit. Um, I think the real disgrace is the, the attempt to restructure and change um, to reset the base. The fact that so many elected officials and appointed officials can look us in the eye and look cameras in the eye and just lie with impunity and colossal gall is frightening because it makes the entire civic engagement toxic. And that is the true disgrace here. Time to say something nice about 2020. Good luck, Patty. Well, the people and places we've lost, and we aren't going to recognize for a long time how much that's changed the fabric of the city. Look at one of the first victims of COVID was Freddie Rodriguez Sr., who played at El Chapultepec, which just closed announced it was closing at the end of December. We will take, it's going to take a long time to restore all those institutions that make Denver a great city. David. Firefighters, they are the brave and the bold. And bad as the fires were, they would have been a hundred times worse without them. Not often have so many owed so much to so few. Eric, we go to you. All those around the country and around the globe who've lost family members and loved ones to this virus. Uh, hearts go out to them. Uh, and everyone deserves praise who took this virus seriously. People are able to react differently, but everyone who took it to heart, took it seriously, and put the interests of their neighbor and the person on the other end of the breath coming out of their mouth uh, above their own interests. Penn, wrap it up for us. Again, ditto Eric, um, you know, with a national pandemic we've seen, we've all known people um, who've gotten sick and some of us have known people who have died, but the strength of the human spirit continues. It reminds me of a quote from one of my favorite books, in the dark soul of the night, bright flows the river of God. And I want to say something nice about the crew here at PBS 12. Putting on Colorado Inside Out this year was never, was never easy, and we had to do it eight different ways. Uh, specifically, I want to thank uh, our crew, which includes Adrian Eatman, L. Neff, Chad Adams, Julius Ames, and Larry Patchett, and of course, our director, Steven Zinn. That's how we're able to get the show to you every week, and it is not without their uh, magnificence behind the scenes that it actually happens. And despite this year not being a banner year for good news, I also want to thank all of you who continue to watch and support Colorado Inside Out. We consider it a privilege to join you in your living rooms every Friday or maybe your tablet Saturday afternoon. You make what we do possible. And as we finish another year, I want to thank all of you for watching. Please tune in next week when we offer our look ahead to 2021. Probably a little rosier than this one. On behalf of us, all of us here at PBS 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.